Can you improve your blood sugar and take control of diabetes while reducing your dependence on medication? Is that possible? That is what we are going to find out here today. I suspect that the answer is Y-E-S. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. We appreciate you joining us to help make the world a healthier place. So how is this possible? You may have had diabetes for years and you've pricked your fingers to death. You've been checking your blood sugar. You've been checking it often and you've taken more shots than a crowd at a Jimmy Buffett concert and you're just tired of it. Or maybe you're somebody that has prediabetes. You see that that's what's in your future. You don't want that either. So what can you do? Well, today we will be talking about a scientifically proven method that you have been waiting for for so long to help get your health back on track. Today is a special diabetes Q&A with Cyrus Kambata from Mastering Diabetes. And if there's a question that you would like to ask Cyrus, go ahead, post that in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can here on the program here today. And as always, Always, you can also send them to me anytime on Twitter or Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll, WLC. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome the man with the Mastering Diabetes Plan, Cyrus Kambata, to the exam room live. My friend, good to see you. It's great to see you, Chuck. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I always enjoy talking with you. Well, I always enjoy it too. And I'm not the only one, right? The feedback that we get when you are on the show is always just amazing. We hear from so many people who say, this guy just has a way of breaking down this complicated science and putting it in terms that we can all understand and really gives us this hope that we can bring everything under control when it comes to our health, man. So you're a fan favorite. So really, you're doing all of us a favor by being here today. Awesome. I, I'm actually really glad to hear that because um, when I was in graduate school, I was given the opportunity to teach graduate students or sorry, to, to teach undergraduate students. And there's just some tough concept, you know, concepts here in the world of biochemistry and molecular and cellular biology. So I'm sitting here trying to go through all this coursework and I'm like, how do I explain this stuff to, you know, people who are new to the idea of biochemistry and whatnot? So I had to basically like develop a methodology to try and take really complex topics and break them down into like almost little games. And uh, I'm glad to see that, you know, people are, are finding that it's very helpful because I'm telling you, the, the world of nutrition, the world of biology can get really complex really quickly, especially with a bunch of like complicated names. And unless you break it down and make it real simple, it's just going to be a bunch of gobbledygook. All right. Well, let's start doing some simple breakdowns here, man. We'll get to the first question here. Uh, Ro is wondering, I mean, Ro was a, a longtime viewer of the show. Uh, and Ro knows that when we're talking about ways to improve your blood sugar um, and doing it without medication, one of the first things you're going to want to look at is overhauling that diet and looking at that plant-based diet. So Ro, though, is wondering how effective, Cyrus, is a plant-based diet compared to traditional treatment for diabetes? Oh, okay. This is a great, 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 great question. All right, Ro. So here's a simple way to think about it. If you're, tr if you're living with some form of diabetes and you're trying to find a way to lower your blood glucose values, which is in the fasting state and also in the post-meal state, and also lower your A1C value, which is a sort of three month average blood glucose uh, concentration. Um, there's, there's almost like two different routes you can take. Route number one, which is a sort of traditional way of handling diabetes, is to go down the low carb route. You see this all over the place. You see billboards with it. You see magazine covers with it. It's everywhere. It says low carb diet, right? A ketogenic diet, a paleo diet. Carbs are your enemy. Carbs will make you fat. Carbs will raise your cholesterol. Carbs will make you more diabetic. They'll spike your insulin. They'll raise your A1C and beyond. So a lot of people gravitate towards that because they're like, oh, okay, I don't want to deal with that. I heard carbs are bad for me. Let me avoid carbs. So they go down the low carb route. The other path that you could take is to go down the plant-based route. And the plant-based route is actually high in carbs. Okay. I like to think of it rather than talking about it as being a high carb diet. I like to think of it as a low fat diet because that's truly what it is. So you have, you have two different ways. You got the low carb route, you got the low fat route. And if you look at the research and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what are the benefits of going this direction versus what are the benefits of going this way? What you'll find is that when you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you will get phenomenal short-term results. And when I say short-term, I'm talking about results that happen in the first month to two months to three months to six months, sometimes upwards of one to two years um, on average. And those results include lower A1C value, lower fasting blood glucose value, 
lower post-meal blood glucose value, lower body weight, which is always a good thing, lower uh, total cholesterol, lower triglycerides, and lower blood pressure. Who doesn't want that, right? If you're looking for lower biomarkers for your cholesterol metabolism and your glucose metabolism, and you also want to lose weight, then a low-carb diet seems like a very good option. If you go down the opposite path and you look at the plant-based route, you will also get the exact same results in the short term. Lower A1C, lower fasting glucose, lower post-meal blood glucose, lower body weight, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, lower LDL cholesterol, which is a bonus. Um, and all of those are good things as well. But where it, where it changes, where things get different between the low carb and the low fat route is in time. If you just fast forward your life beyond the one year marker, beyond the two year marker, you get to five years, you get to 10 years, you get to 15 years. What you will find in the evidence-based research is that the people who took the low carb route actually have worse health. They have a higher risk for many chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease. They are at a higher risk for cancer. They are at a higher risk for the development of autoimmune conditions, and they actually have a difficult time controlling their body weight into the future. They may lose weight to begin with, but then they'll hit a plateau, and sometimes that weight will come right back over the course of time. If you go down the plant-based route, the low-fat route, what you'll find is that the short-term results stick, and they stick for longer periods of time because when you eat a plant-based diet that's high in fiber and high in micronutrients, you end up with increased health over the course of time. So you end up with lower risks for heart disease, a lower risk for cancer, a lower risk for autoimmune disease and beyond. So really what I want people to understand here is that yes, a, a low carbohydrate diet can certainly get you results, but it's short term results that often turn into a long term metabolic liability. If you want to make results in the short term and that's all you care about, then do the low carb thing by all means, go for it. But if you want short term results and you want long term results and you really want to significantly improve your uh, your, your, your longevity and significantly reduce your chronic disease risk, then there is only one option. And that one option is a plant-based diet that is low in fat. And by doing the combination of those two, you're going to put yourself in the best possible situation for results today and results into the future. All right. Now that all sounds well and good, but Buttons here is about to put you on the hot seat with this one. Uh, <laughs> Buttons is wondering what are realistic expectations that people should have when hoping to reverse diabetes by adopting a plant-based diet? Okay. So let's be very clear about this, Buttons. <clears throat> when we're talking about reversing diabetes, we are, we're, talking, we're talking about reversing pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes and gestational diabetes. Those are the three types of diabetes that are reversible. Again, pre-diabetes, type two, and gestational. If you're talking about living with type one or 1.5 diabetes, the answer is you cannot reverse those conditions because both of those are autoimmune conditions. And to this day, we don't have a known therapy that can actually reverse either one of those autoimmune conditions. So as long as we're on the same page and we're talking about either pre-diabetes or type two diabetes or gestational diabetes, realistic expectations can be determined by measuring one thing that most people don't even know about. And the one thing that I would highly recommend you measure is a thing called a C peptide value. So you go to the doctor and you say, Hey doc, I would like to go get a C peptide measurement. Can you please authorize that? Then they fill out a form and they say, okay, you take this to your laboratory. You go get a laboratory. They go take a blood test and they get you your C peptide result. The C peptide is a marker of your endogenous insulin production. In other words, in English, what that means is that if I measure your C-peptide value, the C-peptide value is going to tell me how capable your pancreas is of manufacturing insulin. And insulin is absolutely required in order to regulate your blood glucose. So your C-peptide can come back in either a low, medium, or high state, if you will. It's one of three categories. If your C-peptide value comes back as high, or medium, what that means is that you can use your diet to reverse the underlying cause of prediabetes type 2 and gestational diabetes, which is called insulin resistance. And that's going to work almost 100% of the time. Okay. Again, if your C-peptide is high or medium, then you can use your diet and your diet alone. And that's going to get you almost a 100% chance of reversing either of those three conditions. 
if your C peptide comes back as low, then using your lifestyle may not be enough. I certainly would still recommend you eat a plant-based diet. I certainly would recommend that you lower your fat intake. And I certainly would recommend that you eat fiber rich foods at all times, but that may not be enough. In addition to that, you may still need some oral diabetic medication. And in certain situations, you still are, you, you may require the use of insulin in order to lower your blood glucose from the outside world, either using a syringe or an insulin pump or something like that. Okay. So in order to determine how realistic it is for you to use your diet and diet alone, you need to have to must get your C peptide value measured. And the numbers that you're looking for is low is considered zero to one. If you're zero to one, you're considered low. If you're between one and three, you're considered medium. And if you're, if you're three or higher, you're considered high. So please write those numbers down, go get the C peptide measurement, come back. We can talk about it again and hopefully set you up for success. All right. Chris is uh, getting caught up in the language a little bit. Uh, Chris is wondering whether reversing diabetes is the same as curing diabetes. Can, can you say that? Okay. Very good question. Um, the truth is that there's a lot of confusion in the world about what words you're allowed to use. Can you use the word reverse? Can you use the word, use the word cure? I've also seen the word remission as though, you know, similar to what you would find if, uh, in diagnosis of cancer. So here's the deal. I don't care what word you use. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what word the American Diabetes Association claims is legal to use. I don't really care what doctors claim is legal to use. The word that I choose to use is reverse. And the reason I use, I choose the word reverse is because from a biological perspective, if you look at the actual biochemistry of the development of insulin resistance, insulin resistance is a combination of biochemical pathways that you can initiate using primarily your food. When you eat a diet that is high in fat, when you eat a diet that is high in protein, and when you eat a diet that is low in carbohydrate material, you can initiate the development of insulin resistance inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. And again, that's a collection of pathways that starts and then continues to get worse over the course of time. If you then switch your diet and you start to eat a high fiber diet that is low in total fat, especially saturated fat, that is low in protein and that is high in whole carbohydrate material, what you will find is that those the biochemical pathways that were turned on that created insulin resistance, those biochemical pathways reverse themselves and they actually turn off. And so as a result of that, from a biochemical perspective, you are actually turning on or turning off pathways. And the actual, uh, the, the biochemistry tells you that these processes are reversible. So that's why I use the term reverse because you can not only change the biochemical pathways, but you can actually reverse prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes and get rid of them and then get off of your medical record and you don't have to deal with them any longer. I love it. You are a smart guy. I mean, no wonder the exam roomies love you so much, man. You are just, you are just a smart guy. You're, you're using all of these complicated words, but again, you're putting it in a, in a way, you're framing it so that we can all understand it, man. Uh, you, you Thanks, are brother. The, I appreciate you, that. You, you are the man. Uh, I want to say hi real quick to uh, Chris, who's joining us today live. Cindy is here. Annette is here. Diana Banana also here hanging out with us in the <laughs> chat room uh, with Annette. And I want to say a special congratulations to Rochelle, uh, who says that uh, I went for my annual physical this morning and the doctor was very happy. I've kept the weight off for over a year and I'm pain-free since going plant-based. Love that success story. Congratulations, Rochelle. That is awesome, right? Yeah. Amazing. All right. Uh, let's take a question from Michelle. Michelle is wondering, Cyrus, whether it's possible to do this at any age. Oh, that's one of my favorite questions of all time. Okay. Here's the deal. Um, there is a podcast uh, that was, there was the Joe Rogan podcast and it was Chris Kresser versus, uh, la, 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 la. it was Chris Kresser versus James Wilkes, the creator of the Game Changers. If you guys have, oh, I don't know, three and a half hours to spare, <laughs> I would listen to that podcast because there's a lot of very interesting conversation that happens. But there was a point in that conversation where they were talking about age and whether or not adopting a plant-based diet is recommended for you know young children versus older uh, individuals. And James Wilkes put it very eloquently. And I, and I absolutely love the way he phrased it. He said, when th there is no, according to the scientific literature, there is no period of time in the human evolution 
for which a plant-based diet cannot lead to dramatic benefits. There isn't a, a single period of time in which any, any stage within the human life cycle for which a plant-based diet is not beneficial. And when he said that, I was like, oh my God, that's such a great way to think about it because the human life cycle moves in stages. When you're first born, you're a newborn, and then you develop into a toddler, and then you develop into an infant, and then you develop into an adolescent, or maybe a child, and then an adolescent, and then you're an adult, and then you become elderly, right? So the, you know all these different phases. And the question is, is it possible to apply plant-based nutrition to any one of these phases? And the answer is yes, because you can derive significant improvements at every single stage in the life cycle. And the scientific community has not found a single moment in the human evolution for which a plant-based diet is not beneficial. When it comes specifically to diabetes and reversing, like we're talking about, reversing the insulin resistance collection of biochemical pathways, the answer is you can do that at any age, okay? You can do that when you're a six-year-old kid and you've been eating junk food or you've been eating high fat and high processed foods just because that's what your parents provided to you. You can, you can initiate, you can reverse the insulin resistance process at a very, very young age. And that's a really good thing because that'll carry with you into the future years. But what if you're 87 years old? What if you're 94 years old? Is it too late? Does that mean that, you know, metabolic disease has set in and that insulin resistance has set in and that you can't lose weight and that heart disease is set in and it's not reversible? The answer is heck no, not even close. Okay. I'll tell you a quick story. There was a, a woman that we had worked with. Her name is Marilyn and she was in her 80s when we started working with her. She came to us because she was living with type one diabetes, just like myself. And she said, Cyrus, listen, here's the deal. My blood glucose is so well controlled. It's unbelievable. I have better blood glucose than you. And I was like, really? That's awesome. If you do, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. She said, I don't really care about controlling my blood glucose any better. I have no energy. I can't get out of bed. I wake up in the morning and it feels like I got hit by a bus and it's been that way for the last 15 years. I am looking for a way to eat that is going to, number one, continue to help me improve my blood glucose, but number two, I need energy in order to live my life to its fullest. And I was like, all right, well, let's see what we can do. So we started teaching her how to adopt a plant-based diet and we started dropping her, her fat intake. Now, her blood glucose actually stayed rock solid stable, which is in a person with type 1 diabetes to make that drastic of a transition and keep your blood glucose stable is a big deal. So her blood glucose stayed nice and stable. Her insulin use did not change us at all. And that's both of those are very good things. But then over the course of time, three months into that, she was like, yeah, I think I'm getting a little bit of energy. Six months into it, she's like, okay, I'm feeling a little bit better. She can get up. She can start walking around her house. She can start doing other things. By the time she hit the one and a half year marker, Marilyn had written back to me and said, Cyrus, I want you to understand something. Not only did I, was I able to get out of bed and walk around my house and go to the kitchen and do normal things, you know, within my house. But I started to feel so good eating this way that I started leaving my house. I started going to the grocery store. I started buying groceries. I started carrying two bags of groceries all the way back from the grocery store. Then I started getting on my bicycle and riding my bicycle around town. And now I don't even know what to do with all this energy. I haven't felt this way in 15 plus years. And all of it is due to the way that you told me to eat. This is amazing. It works. And there's no question that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I was like, I, I heard that story and I started to cry because here she was in her eighties thinking like, oh, I'm beyond repair. There's no way I can fix this. But that was just a, a figment of her imagination. And she's just one of many other people that have gone through that same process at an advanced age. Bro. That is a game changer of a story right there. That is a game changer. Never too late, man. I yeah. love, 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 love hearing stories like that. That's incredible, man. Completely got her life back. Just yeah, incredible. I mean, ju I mean, just think about it. Like, imagine living a life where you literally could not get out of bed. You are lying in bed all day long because you just don't have the energy to literally put your feet on the ground. Like, what kind of a quality of life is that? Right. And you go from that to changing the way you eat. And all of a sudden you're on your bicycle, you're riding around town just because you have so much energy. You feel like a little puppy. Like that's unbelievable. That's a game changer. That's a at, life changer. At 80 years old, you've got more energy than a puppy. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. Right. Take all the other, you know, amazing stuff out of the equation. You just say like 80 years old has more energy than probably her grandchildren do. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Amazing to me. 
I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's unbelievable, man. That's why I love this show and hearing stories like that, man. It just, oh man, it just tickles the old uh, heartstrings, doesn't it? Um, all right. Uh, you ever been to, uh, to Rome? You ever been to Rome, Italy, Cyrus? Rome is one of my favorite cities of all time. Absolutely. It, Why? Because we, we have uh, Cynthia right now checking in from uh, Rome, Italy. I thought that that was, that was pretty neat. Yeah. I love cool. it. I got to get there someday. Uh, let's go, though, to uh, Korea. Take a question from Rubber Band Man. Uh, Rubber Band Man says, I'm not diabetic, but my glucose was a bit high when I got some testing done recently, but I was told I could not eat my sticky short grain rice, but I can't stop eating it because it's a food staple for me. I've started to mix some brown rice into it. I've got about a 70-30 white to brown rice ratio in there. What are your thoughts, Cyrus, when it comes to white rice? Okay. This is, this is a great question because I was doing a little deep dive with my wife the other day because um, we would go to a restaurant and we would eat some rice <clears throat> and then I would check my blood glucose in the middle of the night and my blood glucose was a little high. And I was like, oh, okay. Like really rice was the only variable. I guess it's the, I guess it's the white rice that, that didn't work for me. Then we went to a friend's house and had some white rice inside of a meal and I ate that. And I went to sleep and I woke up in the middle of the night, blood glucose rock solid, woke up the next morning, blood glucose rock solid. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. I had white rice on two separate occasions and sometimes it's high and sometimes it's low. And then I started doing a deeper dive and I was like, ah, all white rice is not created equal. There's different types of white rice. Sometimes you get the sticky white rice, you know, sometimes there's like the Japanese sticky white rice. And then sometimes you get the Jasmine white rice. Sometimes there's a Basmati white rice, right? And so what I have learned is that all white rices do not treat your blood glucose the same, okay? For me, the stickier the rice, the higher my blood glucose goes, which is why now I, if I do eat rice, which I eat on a weekly basis, I gravitate towards the jasmine white rice or the basmati rice. The, both of those, I can eat boatloads of that stuff and my blood glucose is rock solid. But if I eat the sticky white rice, all of a sudden my blood glucose goes through the roof. So what I would recommend for you to do is just two things. Number one, don't avoid rice, okay? There's this common concept that like rice is bad, rice is full of carbs, rice is going to make me fat, rice is going to make me more diabetic. It is not a true statement. Number one, if you want to eat rice, you have a green light to eat rice. Number two, do some experimentation on your own to try and figure out if there's a specific color, shape, size, of grain that gets you good results? If so, repeat that. And if you eat a specific type of rice and it causes your blood glucose to do weird things, then maybe you want to shy away from that. The last thing I'll say is that my favorite kind of rice is black rice. I don't know if you guys have ever eaten black rice before, but we traveled over to Indonesia a couple of years ago and they serve black rice all over the place. And that stuff is incredibly good, okay? Not only is it a good flavor, but it keeps my blood glucose stable. And most importantly, the reason why it's black is because it's got a very high mineral and nutrient content. And the specific types of minerals and nutrients in them, um, some of them are antioxidants. Some of them are phytochemicals, which tend to be very disease-fighting chemicals or compounds that you get from the plant world only. So if you can get your hands on some black rice, that would be my recommendation because generally speaking, the darker the color in any given fruit or vegetable, the more pigment it has, the more antioxidants it has, and the better it is for you. Black rice, huh? I wonder if that's just got like extra fiber in it too, because it's so dark, right? It's not white rice, certainly, where the fiber content may be a little bit less. Brown rice, it's even darker than that. So is it like black rice could just be this magical rice, right? I mean, maybe that's what it should just be called. I don't Magic know. Rice. There's also <laughs> actually, there's a red rice as well. And I, I don't have as much experience with red rice, but um, the, yeah, a, a lot of it, I don't know about the fiber. That's a really good question. I want to go do a little learning on that one. Yeah. Don't take that one as the gospel. I'm purely speculating here. Please sure. don't say, well, Chuck said this and it must be so. No, I'm just speculating <laughs> here. Uh, all right. Uh, how much do you uh, deal with a hypoglycemia? Do you deal with that at all? Yeah, hypoglycemia is definitely a real thing. So hypoglycemia refers to low blood glucose. All right. And if you're dealing with American units, what that means is that if your blood glucose falls beneath 70 milligrams per deciliter, that means technically speaking, you're in the low blood glucose territory. It's not a fun place to be. All right. Let's see if we can get Leanna's creations here. A little bit of help. Uh, was born with severe hypoglycemia. And to this day, it does not take much for my blood sugar to drop too low. She sent this at 1058. How do I do a fast and still not get the shakes? Is this okay. possible? All right. So uh, 
when you, I think she said I was born with hypoglycemia. Is that born with born severe, severe hypoglycemia? hypoglycemia. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So first things first, let's talk about what causes hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is basically caused by the excess production of insulin. So the, when insulin is present in your blood, insulin knocks on the door of your liver and knocks on the door of your muscle. It goes, Hey, liver muscle, there's glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? And under normal circumstances, when your liver and muscle can respond to insulin and they're very you know, alert and they're able to recognize insulin at the cellular level, they go, okay, cool. Sounds like a plan. And they open their doors and they allow glucose to come in. And that's a good thing because it lowers glucose in your blood and it allows glucose to enter your liver and muscle exactly where it's supposed to be. Okay. So if you have excess insulin in your blood for any number of reasons, number one, maybe you injected too much insulin because you're a human and you made a mistake. Number two, your pancreas might over secrete insulin because your pancreas, uh, you know, or, sorry, let me just say your pancreas may over secrete insulin due to a number of reasons. But if that's the case and the concentration of insulin in your blood is a little too high, then what it'll do is it'll say, Hey, knock, knock glucose. I'm sorry, knock, knock liver, knock, knock muscle. Do you want to take the glucose up from the blood? And both of them will say, sounds like a plan. And they'll pull in glucose and they'll continue to pull in glucose, and they'll continue to pull in glucose, and they'll continue to pull in glucose. And at a certain point, the glucose level in your blood drops so low that all of a sudden your brain goes, alarm bells, alarm bells, alarm bells, uh, we're low on glucose, low on glucose. And the reason why it matters for your brain is because your brain can only run off of glucose, okay? Your brain can only run off of glucose, and in emergency backup situations can switch over different film bodies, which we're not going to talk about right now. But- it's an integrated mechanism that starts in your pancreas and involves your liver and your muscle and your brain. It's all in one. So here's the deal. If you are eating a diet that causes hypoglycemia, generally speaking, the types of foods that cause hypoglycemia is called reactive hypoglycemia. Usually about one to two hours after a meal are the foods that are in, uh, that contain refined carbohydrates, cookies, crackers, chips, pastas, breads, sodas, sugar-sweetened vegetables, pastries, sugar-sweetened vegetables, sugar-sweetened beverages. <laughs> hey, man, those exist too. You ever looked at a can of corn? I mean, it's not just corn, man. They will put like corn syrup in with the corn. I'm dead serious, man. You're totally it is, right. It is scary what's, what's in a lot of that stuff. Okay, so sugar-sweetened beverages and sugar-sweetened vegetables, <laughs> right? It's those refined sources of carbohydrates that end up causing your pancreas to over secrete insulin. And then that drives your blood glucose too low over the course of the next few hours. Okay. So if you're eating a refined diet, then you can end up with this hypoglycemic effect and it can happen all to, all, a lot. Okay. Now, if you're born with a uh, tendency for hypoglycemia, which definitely happens to some people, what that means generally is that number one, Either your pancreas is over secreting insulin and the beta cells are just too functional or number two, some people actually have a pancreatic tumor which can increase their insulin production. And that definitely has to be examined and diagnosed by a medical professional. Okay. So here's the question. Well, what can you do about it? Right. Uh, I believe the, 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 the lady that was asking the question was, can I fast and how do I fast without my blood glucose going too low? And my answer to you is if you uh, have a physiological, uh, physiologically are producing too much insulin and it's driving you low, I would not fast. I definitely would not fast because you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation whereby you're cutting yourself off from nutrients from the outside world. And if you're already ha have a tendency to go low, then you're going to go low and it's going to be very uncomfortable and it's not going to work for you. So what I would recommend instead is eat a fiber rich plant-based diet and eating a fiber rich plant-based diet actually can help you lose weight over the course of time and keep that weight off. And so I'm making the assumption that you want to do an intermittent fast so that you can lose weight. And if, if that's not the right assumption, then forgive me. But um, rather than intermittent fasting in that particular situation, I would just eat a low fat plant based whole food diet and watch the weight come off over the course of time. Time is your friend. Use it to your advantage. There you go, man. I love also what you said there about what works for you. I think that that's a key in a lot of situations where somebody's trying to improve their health, right? They they see that something has worked for one person and thus it must work for them. But, you know, the fact is you have to find, at least in my experience, what works for you. And that's the key to long-term success. And you talk sure. about eating a low-fat plant-based diet. 
we're talking about finding what works for you. I mean, that's just, that's the foundation right there, but you can build a, a really tailored low fat plant-based diet to your palate that you enjoy. Um, and, and that's what makes it sustainable. And that's what makes it work again, at least in my opinion, I think that that's key. I'm sure that a lot of people who you work with at mastering diabetes as well have had that similar experience. Yeah, there's no question about it. You, you need to have to must individualize it. There's no question about it. So a lot of people tell me they're like, they're like, Cyrus, there's no one size fits all approach for human health. And I'm like, you know what? You're totally right. You're absolutely right. Because we all different shapes, different colors, different sizes. Uh, we have different physiological requirements. We have different energy requirements. We have different activity levels. We have different physical injuries. I mean, our guts function differently. Our brains function differently. The biological diversity is insane. Okay. But just because of that doesn't necessarily mean that the overall concept of eating a plant strong diet doesn't work for most people. The truth is that that works for an overwhelmingly large proportion of the population. But within that, that concept of, okay, I'm going to eat more plants. Okay. You get to be the one to experiment, to figure out what do you enjoy eating? What is going to help you achieve your weight goals? What's going to help you reduce your need for medication? What's going to allow you to be an active individual? What is tasty to you? How much food do you have to eat? And the list goes on. So the individualization is required. And it's something that you will do over the course of time. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But our suggestion, Chuck's suggestion, my suggestion, Dr. Barnard's suggestion is all the same, which is eat a lot of plants. Period, end of story. Just eat a whole bunch of plants and most of your you know, metabolic complications will disappear over the course of time. Keep it simple. Eat a lot of plants. That's 100%. it. Uh, all right, let's uh, head out to the Bay Area. That's where Yvonne is. She sent this one in at 1157. I actually hope to get out there and do a live show out in California here in the next few months. So stay tuned for details on that. But Yvonne's question, uh, in your opinion, what is the optimal time, Cyrus, to mm -hmm. test glucose upon awakening? With mm -hmm. the Dawn effect, is this reading valid or is it just inflated? Okay. Uh, so let's back up here. Let's talk about the Dawn phenomenon. So the Dawn phenomenon is basically a phenomenon that happens in all people, regardless of whether you're living with diabetes or not. And it's, it's a way for your, uh, your adrenal gland to effectively raise your blood glucose first thing in the morning um, to get your brain ready for activity. That's pretty much the, the main effect of it. Okay. So picture this, you're sleeping in your bed. It's four o'clock in the morning. It's five o'clock in the morning and you're wearing a continuous glucose monitor, meaning that your blood glucose is being sampled on a five minute basis, but you're asleep. You don't even know. And what you see on your blood glucose monitor is that your blood glucose is stable. It's at like 85, 86, 87. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere at like 530 in the morning, all of a sudden, boom, glucose starts to rise. Now it's a 92. Now it's a 97. Now it's 103. Now it's 111. And you're like, I'm not doing anything. I'm literally just sleeping. Right. Okay. There's a lot of things happening in the background. Your adrenal, your adrenal glands basically being like, hey, it's time to wake up. So it starts to secrete just a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of cortisol. That goes to your liver, knocks on the door of your liver, and your liver's like, hey, I got some glucose, and it puts glucose into the blood. The blood then circulates. It goes up to your brain. It says, hey, brain, we're about to wake up. Are you ready? And so the brain all of a sudden is like, okay, cool. Now I see there's more glucose. There's more fuel, and it prepares both your physical, you know, your musculoskeletal system and your brain for being awake, Okay. Totally normal physiology, completely conserved across all of the mammalian world. Cats do it. Dogs do it. Monkeys do it. Raccoons do it. Mice do it. Rats do it. It's totally normal. But the question is, is that good for me or is that not good for me? And the answer is, it's totally normal. It's, it's, it's required. And people with diabetes end up actually being able to measure that because they're checking their blood glucose every single day and they can see the effects of that. Okay. So the Dom phenomenon don't be afraid of it. But what I do want you to understand is that if you wake up in the morning and your blood glucose is already elevated because of the dawn phenomenon, don't freak out. It's totally fine. You can actually control the severity of the dawn phenomenon with the food that you're putting in your mouth. Okay. Let me explain this one. When you eat a low carbohydrate diet, what we have found empirically, meaning what we have found by working with a lot of people over the course of time is that the people who eat the low carbohydrate uh, low carbohydrate foods, which are meats and cheeses and dairy products and, and, uh, uh meats, cheese, dairy products, um, eggs, processed meats, fish, 
those people are the ones who have the strongest dawn phenomena. So they keep their carbohydrate intake nice and low and they're eating a lot of animal-based foods. And then in the morning, all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, my glucose just goes really high really quickly. And then we take people and we switch them over to eating a plant-based diet. And by eating a plant-based diet, what they find is that their blood glucose is nice and controllable all throughout the day. And then in the morning when they wake up, all of a sudden the dom phenomenon is still there, but it's just a little bit less strong, right? So instead of their blood glucose going up by 30, 40 points, now their blood glucose only goes up by 10. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, the strength of this dom phenomenon has decreased significantly, which is a good thing. And then it enables their fasting blood glucose to come down. And then their blood glucose throughout the rest of the day is actually more manageable. Okay. So my recommendation to you is number one, if your blood glucose is going up a little bit in the first thing in the morning, don't worry about it. It's totally fine. Number two, you need to have to must eat a plant strong diet and keep your fat intake below 30 grams per day. Okay. That is a requirement. If you're living with diabetes in my book, if you can do that and you can keep yourself consistent on that regimen, th seven days, 21 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, watch, just watch the dawn phenomenon will become less strong and your fasting blood glucose will drop and you'll wake up in the morning and be like, Oh, finally, I don't have to deal with this thing anymore. That makes my life a lot easier. And my question is how many times can you say dawn phenomenon in a row without getting tongue tied? <laughs> can you say it five times fast? Go. I'm uh, probably not to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, <laughs> let's go uh, one country to the north uh, up in Canada. Sylvie's checking in from Quebec. Hi, Sylvie. Thanks for being here. Uh, we also have some people checking in today from Vancouver, British Columbia. I love that. Uh, Janice is up in Vancouver. Love that area. Uh, Victoria, BC rather. Uh, but I do love BC. Uh, Canada treated me so nicely uh, when I was up there last year. Um, let's take a question though from Chris. I'm sure that this is another popular one that you get, Cyrus about pasta. This one came in at 1232. Can somebody with diabetes eat pasta? Talking about whole grain, of course, and is regular pasta though a complete no-no? Okay. Great question. Great question. In general, um, I would say pasta that you that's made from wheat sources is actually made from the stuff called durum wheat. Okay. Um, usually is uh, relatively problematic. We put it in that we have a classification. We got green light foods, we got yellow light foods, and we got red light foods. Pasta's in the yellow light category. Is it going to kill you? No. Is it is it bad for you? No. Is it going to potentially elevate your blood glucose and maybe cause you frustration? Yes. Okay. That's why it's in the yellow light category. Okay. So rather than consuming the pasta, which is truth be told, a very refined product, okay? If you just think about like, where does pasta come from? How does, how does it turn into like a, a spaghetti, uh, you know, noodle inside of a package on the shelf? Or how do you get it into this little ravioli thing that's on the shelf, right? What you had to do is you had to harvest the wheat. Then you had to take the wheat. You had to, uh, you had to mill it. You had to grind it down. You then had to uh, reconstitute it, add it with other ingredients, turn it into a dough. Then you take the dough and then you put it through an extruder. You turn it into a certain shape. You, you then have to cook it. And then from that point onwards, you can eat it. That's the only way that it's really edible. Okay. So there were a lot of steps required in order for you to get it to your mouth. Every time something happens to it, whether it's grinded or milled or dehydrated or reconstituted, it's losing nutrients. It's losing micronutrients by the time it gets to your plate, it doesn't really have much of a nutritional value anymore. Okay. So as a result of that, it ends up being a relatively refined product. And the, the refined aspect of the product is what causes your blood glucose to do weird things. Okay. So if you're looking for something that's actually a, a more healthful alternative, what I would steer you towards is go to the grocery store and next to the wheat pasta, you will find the pasta that comes from other things that are not wheat such as number one, edamame, number two, black beans, number three, chickpeas, number four, brown rice, uh, number five, I'm sure I'm missing a couple others. But if you can get yourself a bean pasta or a, uh, sometimes they even have like sweet potato pasta, something like that that comes from an actual vegetable rather than a refined grain, you're going to likely find that it controls your blood glucose more. Number two, it's more nutrient dense, which is always a good thing. And number three, it treats your blood glucose better. 
That's my recommendation. Go for that. Try it and, re and report back and let me know how it works out for you. I've been on a red lentil pasta kick recently and uh, have absolutely been loving that. I find that the flavor of that is just magnificent, especially when you put some steamed or some roasted vegetables on top of that. Don't even need pasta sauce, really. You can just do the vegetables and the pasta with that. And then yeah, is there a particular brand of red lentil pasta that you consume? Because I don't even know. I'm, I mean, I can, I'll, I'll shoot you a text after the show. I'm not okay. giving any shout outs here. Uh, okay. you know, you know how that works. Uh, yeah, I got you. I got you. But yes, I like, I like where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Lentil pasta is, is phenomenal stuff. It's very tasty. Uh, all right. Uh, hint though, the brand name starts with a B. The hint is it starts with a B. Uh, Stephen Page at 1240. All right, here's a good one. Uh, talk about uh, what have you done for me lately and how quickly can this work? 90 days into the whole food plant-based life, my fasting sugars are hanging in the 115 to 125 range. What? When can I expect to see that go down? Says I was at 247, 120 days ago. So it's already come way down. He says, maybe I'm just impatient. So is time something that you really need to just kind of have that patience with or is this something like boom i want it i want it overnight and that's the way it should be okay so here we go 90 days in let's think about this okay three months in fasting blood glucose used to be 247 can we put that back on the screen if you don't mind there we go thank you it used to be about 247 and now it is in the 115 to 125 range so just think about the numbers here like that's a that's a bonkers big blood glucose reduction in a good way. Okay. You call it 250. You're down to 125. So that's 125 point reduction in 90 days. Steven, very good work. My hat, my, my, uh, if I was in front of you, I'd give you a giant hug and a giant high five. Okay. You're doing a lot of good stuff. Um, as far as, you know, is Steven impatient? Should Steven just relax a little bit more? Um, I would say two things, Steven. Okay. Three things, four things actually. Number one, the, the way that we describe the mastery and diabetes method is that it's founded upon plant-based nutrition. So the core of the method is about eating a plant-based diet that is low in fat. Okay. When I say low in fat, I do mean low in fat. And by, by that, I mean, for your average individual, we're looking at less than 30 grams of total fat per day, every single day for the rest of your life. Okay. And I know that may sound ridiculous, but that is a true statement. And then you will be, you, you will set yourself up for uh, success if you can follow that regimen. Okay. So my first question to you, Stephen, is are you 100% confident, 100% confident that you are eating less than 30 grams of fat every single day with no deviations? Okay. That's question number one. In order to answer that question, you can use chronometer, my fitness pal, and put all your food in there. And it'll literally tell you how many grams of fat you're eating per day. So do that. Number two, the second part of the mastering diabetes method is to move your body. We recommend moving your body between 30 and 60 minutes per day. And the, the benefits for that, I mean, we could do an entire uh, discussion about why exercise. And the answer is because exercise is awesome for your brain. It's phenomenal for your liver. It's phenomenal for your kidneys. It's really good for your vasculature. It's good for your heart. It's good for your lungs. It's good for your muscle tissue. It's good for everything you could possibly think of. But it's also good for your glucose metabolism. Your pancreas loves to exercise. So if you're not exercising on a daily basis between 30 and 60 minutes, I would incorporate that and that could probably have a pretty pr pr uh, dramatic effect. Number three, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is something that we recommend for not necessarily every individual, but for people to incorporate if they are still trying to lower their blood glucose and especially if they're trying to lose weight. Intermittent fasting is a phenomenally effective technique and I did my entire PhD on understanding the effects of calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. And I was blown away by the results from studies in human beings. So if you're not doing an intermittent fast, at least on a weekly basis, or if you're not doing like a 16, eight fast on a daily basis, I would recommend moving in that direction. And the combination of low fat plus exercise plus an intermittent fast, uh, or intermittent fasting is going to dramatically reduce your blood glucose even more. The last thing I'll say is, are you impatient? Heck no, okay? You're not impatient because you're human and you want good results. But also remember that pre-diabetes and type two diabetes took not just a couple of months to set in or a year to set in or five years to set in, it took your whole life, okay? So I don't know how old you are, Stephen, but I'm just gonna make a guess here that you're somewhere around 45 years old, okay? Chances are, by the time you started manifesting symptoms of prediabetes and, di and type 2 diabetes, 
you have actually been living with insulin resistance for like 15 to 20 to 30 years, but you didn't show any symptoms of it because your body is a mastermind at masking symptoms. So if it took that long to develop, then you got to recognize that it's going to take some time to reverse. You're already doing a really good job. Keep it up, add those other components in and watch as your glucose comes down. And trust me, you got this, uh, you can do this and I know you can. Absolutely. Man, I'm, I'm so happy for, for him, man. I, I just, I think that that, that is such sweet success right there. I mean, that is, that is fantastic. I love hearing things like that. And, uh, we'll grab a couple of more quick ones here before we wrap up, but I also want to say uh, hi to uh, Barbara who's watching today in Ecuador. I'm loving this global effect. Hogan is in Indonesia. Uh, Jake's is in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Hello. Uh, good to see you there. Tell my friend, uh, Charles gentleman that I say hi. Uh, yeah. all right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, let's see here. A couple of more quick ones. Uh, we've been talking a lot about fat here today on the show. Conrad at 1219 wants to know uh, how much fat in a day is enough and how much is too much. So what is the sweet spot when it comes to fat? Okay. The sweet spot, very simple. Between 20 and 30 grams of fat per day, period, end of story. Total fat per day. Okay. Okay. So again, use my fitness pal or use chronometer and literally just log all the food that you're eating on a daily basis. It's on your phone. Just, there's very simple. You can literally like take photos of things. It's, it's mindless. Um, just log all the food you're eating per day. If you're eating somewhere between 20 and 30 grams of fat per day, number one, you're getting enough. Number two, you're not going to be deficient by any stretch of imagination. And number three, you're not getting too much. It is the sweet spot. So if you can aim for that, your glucose will come down. It'll be nice and controlled and just watch, just watch what happens to your glucose when you lower your fat intake. It's bonkers. Let's circle back to the rice. Uh, that was a hot topic there in the chat. Steven is wondering whether the black rice you were talking about is the same as wild rice, which can also be quite dark. Okay. Uh, great question. So wild rice, to the best of my knowledge, has multiple different colors of grains in it. And I think there are black grains inside of the wild rice, but usually wild rice has like some brown and some lighter colored and some darker colors. And it's a combination. Black rice, I saw another comment that uh, somebody else had left. Black rice equals forbidden rice. That's what I was referring to when I talked about black rice earlier. So um, if you can get your hands on some forbidden rice, by all means, go for it. But Stephen, to answer your question, wild rice, if you're eating it, go for it. It's fantastic. Okay. Again, the darker the rice, the more antioxidant rich it is, the better it's going to be for uh, your brain, your liver, and your kidneys simultaneously. <laughs> That sounds so exotic. Forbidden rice. I know. I mean, I know. You're like, should Ooh. I be eating this? I don't know. It's forbidden. I, know. I just, yeah, I just don't know. Uh, really quick here, another success story. I wanted to share this one from uh, Nato George at twelve forty. Uh, Nato writes, "My friend went plant based, and uh, when he did, his type two diabetes went away." Stop taking his meds as well and lost a ton of weight. Love hearing success stories like that, Nato. Amazing. Please uh, tell your friend congratulations on my behalf. That's that's just. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, really quickly, Cindy, uh, how many fruit and green and nuts and seeds can you add to your uh, smoothies per day? So again, we're kind of getting into that fat territory here. Do you recommend keeping the nuts and seeds and the smoothies on the lower end of things? Yeah, exactly right. So um, the only answer to that question would be you got to use chronometer because, uh, or you got to use chronometer or my fitness pal to log all your food to answer that question. So the sweet spot again, 20 to 30 grams of total fat. I don't know exactly what types of fruit, uh, nuts you're adding and nuts have different, you know, varying uh, fat contents between them. Like a Brazil nut has a different fat content than a cashew nut, than a, a walnut as an example. Okay. Um, and how many fruits can you eat? The answer is you can eat fruits unlimited. Fruits are in the green light category. And I know it may sound completely hogwash for someone like me to say, well, you can eat as many fruits as you want because what person living with diabetes says that, but it's a true statement. Okay. Uh, my camera just turned off. It sure did. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at it. There we go. Hey, good to see you again, bud. All right about that. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back. So the answer is eat as many fruits as you want. I eat uh, on average somewhere between 15 and 20 servings of fruit per day. And I've oh, been doing that every day for the last 20 years. So that's my recommendation to you. If you could, if you can make that happen, then you, you'd be, uh, 
you're putting yourself in a good situation. There we go. Hey, hey, so your camera's just giving you uh giving you the business right now, man. Know, That's all right. On. It's kind of a I mean, we've been running long anyway. We can kind of just take it home uh real quick. But uh that's cool. Um man, you, you've been uh, so generous with your time here today. Uh, can't thank you enough. Um just because I mean, you're such a fan favorite, I would love to put you uh on the regular guest list and just keep bringing you back because clearly there are uh, there is no shortage of questions here in the chat room. I feel like we could do this for three, four, five hours and still not run out of questions. So if you're up for it, man, let's just go ahead and, and put you down as a regular. Let's do it. I mean, I, I love talking with you, Chuck. I feel like every time you open your mouth, I'm, I'm either giggling or I'm like, man, this guy is a ridiculously good MC. So okay. any opportunity I get to hang out with you and be on the exam room, uh, I love it. As you know, we're huge fans of PCRM. We love Dr. Neil Barnard. I mean, I remember the very first time I saw Dr. Barnard's book. I was giving a talk at a conference and somebody showed me the book and I was like, oh my God, I like that guy. Like I just, I, I judged <laughs> the book by its cover immediately. I was like, I like that guy. I want to get to know that guy. I want to be, you know, I want to like help develop this, this, this train of thought and the opportunity to, uh, you know, be able to become closer with him and closer with you is something that I value very much. So I'm in, oh, yeah. tell me how I can help. All right, man. Done. Uh, I'll shoot you a text. We'll set everything up and, and we'll get you uh, booked again here in, in the very near future. Uh, Maureen in Germany. Thanks for checking in. Lance Fairbanks, Alaska. Thank you for checking in. Uh, that may be the first exam room live check in from Fairbanks, Alaska. That's awesome, man. And uh, <laughs> uh, Bladio in Nigeria. So cool, man. I'm telling you this global effect that the reach Crazy. that the exam room live and the exam room podcast now have to really help improve health on a global level is nothing short of amazing. We just had a guy on who flew halfway around the world all the way to the uh, International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine uh, last month in August. I met him there. Saw an episode that I did with Dr. Monica Agarwal where she was talking about reversing her rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. And this poor guy, uh, Dr. Daniel Gnu, had had it for two decades, got so bad Cyrus, he couldn't even lift up a piece of paper. I mean, this guy was just disabled and it was just, he was at his wits end. And then his wife caught this episode that I did with Monica Agarwal. And within the span of nine months, he's gotten off of the majority of his medication. He hopes to get off of all of them very soon. Um, and he was so inspired. He flew all the way from Kenya his home in Kenya to come be at the conference and introduce himself to Dr. Agarwal and myself wow. and Dr. Barnard. And it was just, it was one of the more moving experiences uh, that I've ever had in the five years that we've been doing this show. I mean, that's, that's the effect that conversations like what you and I are having here today. That's the effect of these conversations, man. It's not just, we're here having fun and raising health IQs, bro. We're changing lives. And you know this firsthand from your own experience. There is nothing better than that. I mean, uh, that that's touching. I mean, when I when I hear stories like that, it just like it literally makes me want to cry on the inside because um, what's what's interesting about the way that like you know podcasts and and online shows happen in today's world is that you know there's an invisible audience of people out there, and you know that the people exist and they're asking questions and they're participating, but you can't see them, you can't touch them, you can't give them a hug, right? But they're there. And so when you finally do get an opportunity to meet them in person and you, you're like, oh my God, you're a real person. I've seen your comments in the chat box before and now you're here in front of me and you're telling me that you lost 65 pounds, you reversed RA, your cholesterol dropped by 50 points and now you're not using any diabetes medications anymore. Like, are you kidding me? That's real, right? That's what makes it all worth it. So I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, man, it's so cool. It's so cool. Uh, what do you have right now coming up at Mastering Diabetes? What's cooking over there? Oh man, what's cooking right now? So we have been growing our coaching program um, very, very uh, systematically, and it's gotten stronger and stronger than ever before. I mean, we have what's called the six week blood sugar transformation challenge. And we just started this uh, a couple of months ago. And the results that people are getting in the first six weeks are bonkers. <laughs> um, maybe on a separate show, I can sh show some testimonials of people just posting every single day saying, I'm losing weight. My blood glucose has come down by 40 points. I got off of metformin. Um, you know, I have more energy than I've ever had before. You know, the average weight loss within the first six weeks of the program is somewhere between 13 and 16 pounds. And um, people are, their blood glucose is dropping by between 30 and 50 points. So um, if anybody's interested in participating in that, you just go to masteringdiabetes.org slash start. So masteringdiabetes.org slash S-T-A-R-T. Just go there. 
You can sign up to talk with a real human being. We're going to learn from you. We're going to see if you're a good fit for the coaching program. And if you are, come on inside and we can help you change your life from the inside out. Love that, man. And you can also click that link right now. We've got it for you in the uh, show description there. So uh, one one click and, and you're off and running. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you, my uh, man. Cyrus, brother, man, thank you so very much for being here today. Can't wait to have you back on the show, answer some more questions and sprinkle a little more hope around the world, man. You, you, you have a, a way of doing just that, man. So thank you for <laughs> being here, bro. Thank you, my man. I totally appreciate it, Chuck. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Now, listen, a lot of the stuff that we talked about here today, changing your diet, you may have been eating a poor diet for your entire life. And if you're anything like the way that I was getting off of those foods, even though you know that it would really help your health out, it can be a bear because what the emerging science is showing is that these foods are ultra addictive. I mean, we're talking the same levels as drugs and alcohol, my friend. So coming up one week from today on September 21st, I will be speaking at Green Fair Restaurant in Herndon, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., organic uh, cafe, completely whole food plant-based cafe. I'm going to be sharing everything that I've learned along those 13 years as far as how to manage these cravings. I mean, I went from eating 10,000 calories every single day. If we can pull up this picture, there it is. That's me actually actually at Green Fair in front, uh, standing with uh, Gwen and Pericles, who run the place, uh, with an actual pair of my old jeans. And I know that fighting that addiction that is food is just horrific. So I'm going to be sharing what I've learned along the way, some tips that can really help you out the next time that you're at the grocery store or you're just passing drive through after drive through after drive through and they're just all calling to you. How do you how do you pass them by without pulling in? I'll share the tips that uh, that I've learned along the way and also a lot of that emerging science I was just talking about and also might have a fun announcement to make about some uh, new projects uh, that we have coming up. So uh, I'm really excited. I hope to, to be able to share that exclusively with the audience who is there. So if uh, you wanna join us, uh, uh, we're going to be doing Mexican night because Taco Bell is such a huge part of my story as well. We're going to be having a Mexican dinner before the talk. So uh, if you can join us, great. Hop over to greenfair.com or click the link right now that is also in uh, the show description. Dinner is served at 530 and then we will be uh, starting the talk at 630 with Q&A thereafter. I do hope to see you there. But for today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you once again to Cyrus Kambata for being here, helping to raise our health IQs and mastering diabetes with us and also to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you all. And to you, exam roomies, for all of the wonderful questions and your passion and the success stories and the global check-ins. You guys are extraordinary. I cannot begin to express how much I love each and every one of you. You guys are all stars. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again soon, but until then, keep it plant-based.